we kinda beat Final Fantasy XIII without dealing any damage. But it's obvious you guys are hungry for more Persona content. So today on RPG Challenge Runs, we ask ourselves, can you beat Persona 5 Royal with only a single Mandrake? You know, that pathetic level 3 enemy from the tutorial section? Well, we're on the hardest difficulty, Merciless, and we're playing solo. Anytime we're forced to have teammates, they may only guard. We're allowed to use other personas for fusions and confidant boosts, but in battle we may only use Mandrake. And as always, no glitches, hacks, mods, etc, and the DLC personas are banned because they can be itemised into stupidly overpowered equipment. Let's go! We name ourselves Professor Sprout, and while dashing through these tutorial fights, let's have a closer look at the persona that will hopefully be carrying us to victory. Without question, Mandrake is one of the weakest personas in the entire game. It lacks any form of elemental damage output, has very weak offensive stats, a useless trait, and a weakness to fire, which is an extremely common element. Literally the only good thing about this guy is its Polympus skill, which is almost guaranteed to inflict confusion, a status ailment which causes enemies to skip turns, throw away items and catch, and get set up for technical knockdowns, but more on all of that later in the run. Within minutes of entering the first palace, we've knocked a mandrake down and after some upbeat negotiating, it agrees to join us. Welcome to the team, plant boy! We urgently need to get this guy powered up and ready for action. After admiring the new font in the airsoft shop as part of P5R's multi-platform release, we craft our lockpick, complete our first crossword puzzle and the run officially begins. These early battles are super tough. If we get matched against Bicorns, we simply don't have enough damage output to take them on. Luckily, when matched against Pixies, we can utilise their gun weakness to kill at least two of the three in the mob. The third one normally escapes, but at least we get XP and money for the two that we did kill. After a few more basic mobs, we reach level 6 and Mandrake hits level 4, learning Lunge. This is a pretty bad physical skill that costs 5% of our max HP to use, but it inflicts slightly more damage than a regular basic attack. We'll save that for when we really need that extra oomph. Oh, wait, hang on, we haven't even equipped an outfit yet. Uh, let's see here. Well, the Persona 3 Portable Remaster just came out, so Gekko can high it is. Very snazzy. Psst, I'm busy playing through the Persona 3 and 4 remasters now, so yes, you will be getting challenge runs for those games very soon. After some cool grappling, we mug a green-haired lady and Mandrake hits level 5, learning its final skill, Secunda, which also isn't great. Notice how it keeps gaining stat points in endurance, agility and luck, but not in strength and magic? This makes us tankier, but it's seriously restricting our damage output. It means that against enemies like this Bereth, we just stand no chance at all. And against the Exploding Enemies tutorial... Mm, yep, this is not going well. <laughs> Alright, we use our only stun gun to bust through this annoying fight. You could say the enemy Bicorn found the whole experience rather shocking. <laughs> well, we take our beads and boatload of cash and push on into this palace's mini-boss, Heavenly Punisher. For anyone unfamiliar with this guy or can't remember his moveset, he repeats a cycle of charge, cleave and then chillin' by skipping a turn. He deals insane physical damage and needless to say our teammates are dead within seconds. We're only hitting for around 20 odd damage whereas even when we're guarding, he's hitting for over 90! It's just a test of endurance, but after 6 minutes we get greedy and go for a lunge and get punished for it. Now that's what I call MASSIVE DAMAGE! Second attempt and this time we take our time. Recover ours from the clinic, help with the healing and we get him down to a sliver of health. He charges up his next attack and we're on 2 HP! Guarding or healing would just result in us getting one shot, so we have no choice, we have to attack. Come on, yes that's it, sit down! Man that was tough. I think we've earned ourselves an easter egg. Check this out, in the E3 2019 English release trailer for this game, there's a section around the 1 minute 19 mark which shows this footage. 
Yeah, it's Japanese text despite it being the English release trailer, but that's not what's interesting. I have no idea what it says because I don't speak Japanese, but it shows Joker whacking this Kamoshida statue's face, causing its mouth to widen and opening the doors to advance. This was never in the final version because the doors are already open. I'm guessing this was cut to keep things simple, what with this already being quite a complex section of the palace. The optional will see boss is just impossible, so we push on and secure the infiltration route. After hitting level 12, we head back to the real world. As always, we do some laundry to obtain a Duke's coat. It's crazy how good this armour is for this early in the game, with almost double the defence plus an extra 30 to our max HP, wow! We send the calling card and here's our setup going into the Kamoshida boss fight. Our armour is great, our weapons are basic and the arm PC accessory is there for the small plus 3 stat bonuses. We're level 12 and Mandrake's at 9 and looking back at the footage I have absolutely no idea why we didn't heal up before the fight. Alright, let's take this guy down. As always, apologies for the speed of the footage but this was a 25 minute fight that I'm trying to condense down. In just a couple of minutes all of our teammates are dead and we're barely clinging onto life thanks to the recovers from the clinic. His volleyball assault is a pretty nasty physical attack that can hit us between one and three times per use and Kamoshida currently gets twice as many turns as we do. We just play it safe and wait for openings to appear. 14 minutes in and we're getting battered. Somehow though we manage to take down his chalice and push on to the next phase. Thanks to Mishima, Kamoshida's gold medal spike deals a respectable 55 damage, but his subsequent kill shot of love misses, granting us a window to take advantage of Shiho's weakness to everything, taking her out. It's now a 1v1. Kamoshida against Professor Sprout. This is the phase where you're supposed to send a teammate off to steal the crown, but pah, who needs teammates anyway? Kamoshida exclusively spams Golden Knife for 40 something damage each turn, meaning it's just a matter of time before we wrap things up. Sure enough, another 6 minutes later and he is out of there. Job done. That was quite a fun fight, interesting how it seemed to get easier as it went on, the tough part was at the start. Just like in the Bicorn only run, we name ourselves the Challengers. For anyone who hasn't seen that video by the way, all of our challenge runs are now in one playlist for your binge watching enjoyment. They're even broken down by series too, so if you only want the Persona videos, that's fine. It'll all be linked at the end. This Mementos Request tutorial mini boss was quite a tough cookie, but a lucky critical eventually got us the win. We then get ambushed and have to use our only Vanish Ball to escape. Damn, luck is definitely not on our side here. We farm some items, unlock overpowered confidant abilities with everyone's favourite spoiler spoiler, do a bit of button mashing, <coughs> pass out in a bathhouse and it's time for Mandrake here to take on the second palace. Most enemies here are really easy, especially since we're a bit over leveled. Polimpa confuse locks single enemies, allowing us to utilise the elemental items gathered back in Mementos to take them down. After dealing with the barrier thingy, we're up against this mini boss, Security Shadow. Thankfully this one is a bit easier than the Heavenly Punisher from earlier, and while it does deal a lot of physical and curse damage, we can still out heal it, so it's just a battle of attrition. After just a couple of minutes, we go all in for a risky lunge and it pays off. That's 246 XP in the bag. Time for the Yusuke intro fight. If you've seen our previous challenge runs in this game, you already know how hellish this battle is. You're supposed to take advantage of Yusuke's ice skills to make this a really simple fight, but going in solo, well... Yeah, this is not happening. There's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. We're back at level 20 with Mandrake at 15. After one death, we finally have this run. We start by taking out some of the foolish monks while immediately curing rage from teammates so they don't attack. 
it still seems like the fight is going nowhere until this happens. Go down! Looking cool, Joker! Persona! <laughs> what are the odds? Two criticals in a row! Oh wow! Damn, that was satisfying. The game now finally allows us to remove party members, so we ditch them all and push on. Hey, wait! The next mini boss is very similar to the last one, meaning, you guessed it, more deaths. But we do finally have this seven minute fight in which we get enraged, take out the big guy, and then clean up the remaining foolish monk afterwards. We're awarded with our very first skill card, the healing skill Media. Nice! After hopping through some paintings, it's time for another mini boss, three hunting wolf spirits. They're pretty tough, so we try to set up technical combos, but yep, dead on the first turn. <laughs> Thankfully, we soon get RNGs on our side, and the plan is a success. Now that's what I call mass destruction. <laughs> The optional will see boss is tough at first, but with a clever combination of frays, polimpers and guards, it eventually goes down. With itemization now unlocked, we grab the Arsene's cane weapon and the blood red capote armor, both of which are completely overpowered and by far the best gear we can obtain so far. We will be able to keep this stuff equipped for quite a while before anything better becomes available. What's even better is that now that we've learned Frey from a skill card, we can take down these glowing red Shiki Ouija enemies by simply using Frey, Guard, Frey, Guard, Frey, Frey, granting us massive XP and cash rewards. It's also super easy to respawn the guy by simply leaving the room and re-entering. With all of this excess money, we fuse a Rakshasa and itemize it into a Regenerate 1, meaning we will now passively heal ourselves without needing to do anything. Then, after completing 5 Persona requests for the Twins, we gain the ability to pay money to fuse higher level Personas, meaning that with enough cash, we can fuse and then itemize almost any Persona in the entire game. This gives us the potential for getting some really nice items. For now though, let's head back to the real world and send that calling card. Here's our setup going in. We're at level 26 with Mandrake at 20, who is again boasting mostly defensive stats. We've taught it a wide range of elemental skills from Velvet Room skill cards, and our equipment is the same as before. Let's go. First attempt, we go for a rampage and then get one shot by a flame dance. <laughs> Oh, I can't even be angry, that was hilarious. Second attempt, and we last a bit longer before Madarame decides to chow down. Third attempt, we're made weak to all elements, and then maelstromed out of there. Our fourth attempt, though, is much better. Remember, the skills that each face part uses are mostly random, but if either of the eyes use Flame Dance a single time, we are dead, so we need to take him out quick. Luck is definitely on our side as three of the parts fall within seconds, forcing the mouth to restore an eye, which we then just take down with our gun. After we're made vulnerable to all elements, we go for a risky Garula while the mouth regenerates another body part. After taking out the mouth, the fight becomes super easy and we're on to phase two. Madarame's elemental goons are weak to their opposite elements, but we miss a Bufu on the fire one, resulting in us getting one shot. Damn this fire weakness! Fifth attempt, and phase one is mostly the same as before, so I'll save your time. In phase two, Madarame keeps summoning wind elemental goons, which is kind of annoying because we don't have an electric attack to deal with them, but it's better than him summoning fire ones, I suppose. The more goons we defeat, the more likely he is to summon defective copies that spawn with various negative status ailments, so just like Kamachida, the fight becomes exponentially easier as time goes on. As always, there's also an element of luck involved here. We just have to heal up when necessary and not get greedy. Eventually, Mapsy is hitting for massive technical combos, and we can finally push the offensive. A couple of turns later, Madarame is down and makes the best death gargling noise you've ever heard. <laughs> that was good fun. 
A nice challenge with a good mix of difficulty, skill, and luck. After Maraki does the Salt Bear meme, uh, sorry. we farm stamps and items in Mementos, complete more crosswords, and start working out. The gym is almost essential for these challenge runs, raising our max HP and SP with every visit, boosted by various proteins. We stick Mandrake in lockdown for stat buffs and elemental resistances, go play billiards, and by the time it comes out, it's looking so much happier. Uh, I think. On to Palace 3, and these big boys don't have any weaknesses, so we just have to rely on Burn Garula technical combos which deal massive damage. Both mobs are down in just a few minutes. After more billiards, we get Ryuji's Chariot Confidant up to rank 7, unlocking the ability to dash insta-kill weak enemies. This will be a huge time saver later on. While some mobs in the bank are hellishly difficult, most of them are manageable so long as we know their weaknesses to exploit. While we make our way through this palace, I want to talk about something I've been working on. So if you're an experienced player at this game, or have ever tried 100%ing it, you've probably had to rely on various guides to optimise your experience. But the 100% guides aren't built for advanced players, so you also need to turn to the internet. Confidant answers open in one tab, crossword puzzle solutions in another tab, then another for exam solutions, fusion guides, boss weaknesses, etc. It's really faffy, and to make matters worse, lots of these guides are riddled with errors because they were made hastily when the game first came out. So here's what I've been working on. A full, optimised, min-max guide to Persona 5 Royal. Not only does it recommend what you should do in each in-game day, but it even reminds you when to put your personas into lockdown, when the TV shopping channel is on, when to water your plant, when Trader Sakai has new deals, when to buy moist and imported proteins from the mall, when to buy wine of graces from the church, as well as the obvious stuff that you'd expect like answers to classroom questions and part-time jobs, and what answers to give in confidant events. Basically, I want this to be something that you can print out or just keep open beside you and be able to go into each palace knowing you've spent every second of your free time slot optimally, giving you the best chances of doing things like challenge runs. It's all of my Persona 5 Royal knowledge in one document and it will no doubt evolve over time because I want other people's opinions on how it can be optimised even further. As of February 2023, it's not finished yet, but if you think this would be useful to you, I'm putting it up as a Patreon reward for anyone in the middle or upper tier as a thank you for supporting the channel. I'll also be making min-max guides for Persona 3 and 4 as well because I want the Patreon page to be offering value to you and not just be a charity. There are also various pulls on there as well as full-length regular speed boss fights for you to enjoy. But enough of that, we have a Will Seed boss to defeat. Thankfully, this thing is weak to ice and therefore falls in just a few turns. Nice! We've secured the infiltration route, but as always, we're gonna farm for a bit. Sayo replaces Mapsy, and with this strongest skill, we can kill the glowing red enemies in one turn! Wow! We just run back and forth in and out of this door to keep respawning it. While doing this, we take advantage of the fusion alarms to create an even better weapon and even better armour. We're now able to dash insta-kill this guy, making farming even faster. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, this is crazy! Rakshasa becomes Regenerate 2, which yes, does stack with Regenerate 1. Ose becomes High Counter, giving a 20% chance to reflect physical damage, and we just keep filling up the compendium. We hit level 45, and it's time to take on Kaneshiro. Here's our setup going in. Pikitron is up first, and after his usual missile party and ocular Vulcan, he just spams super VIP form plus March of the Piggy for the entire phase. We're playing solo, so we can't do anything about this. It's just a case of guarding, healing, and occasionally attacking whenever there's an opportunity. To be honest, it's kind of boring. 14 minutes later, he's down, and we're on to phase 2. What I forgot is that Kaneshiro's team always goes first in this phase, so... Yeah... Uh, oh, oh wait, maybe? Uh, okay, never mind. We reload our earlier save file and itemize a Tam Lin during a fusion alarm to obtain the Fairy Hero armor. This lowers our evasion, but massively boosts our defense and gives plus 7 magic, meaning we'll be able to output a lot more damage now. This time, Kaneshiro stands no chance. 
Wait, what? Hang on, wait, wait, wait. Let's just talk about this. Ah! Next attempt, we guard the missile party and counter the ocular Vulcan. Nice, great start. From there, it's the usual guard, heal, guard attack cycle for almost 10 minutes before we push on to phase 2. This time around, we have more health, so we're much more prepared for his team. But getting two counters in a row is also kinda nice. Ha <laughs> ha! Our first priority is killing the annoying fly bodyguard on the left, then we can use the sleep vials to set up technical combos on the larger defensive bodyguard on the right. A few minutes later we burn him out of there and now it's a true 1v1. We've been quite lucky so far avoiding Kanashiro's sleeps but it's probably due to Mandrake's high luck stat. He's soon making it rain which deals massive damage but starts missing after we burn him down and he runs out of cash. <laughs> See you later piggy boy. 3402 XP in the bag. Following the third palace we get scammed out of a hundred grand, continue locking down and releasing Mandrake, strike a pause at Kanda Church, hit the gym for dem big gains, listen to Morgana spamming that bloody voice line. Listen up. I... I'm... Listen up. Sure. Listen up. Very well. Listen up. Okay. Very well. Listen up. What are you doing? Listen up. Defeat more request mini bosses in mere seconds. Yeah, these guys are a joke. Unlock more confidants, do our best impression of Crash Bandicoot, sparkle and shine, trade an old army ration for a calculus textbook with a shady face mask guy in a Japanese alleyway. <laughs> what the hell is going on in this game? Oh, it sounds so ridiculous. And push on through Futaba's pyramid. I really like the aesthetic of this pyramid. It's so varied yet bright and interesting. I think the space port is still my favorite palace though, not including the boss. Hmm. What would you say is your favourite? Now's a good time to type something out while we run through this place. Just please don't say Shido's cruise ship. Like, I don't think I've ever met anyone who actually likes that palace. <laughs> the damn rat puzzles. Speaking of rats, against this mini boss we get ratified and slashed out of there, but somehow manage to get our revenge on the second try. This is always a tough fight when playing solo. To make matters worse, there's an almost identical mini boss shortly afterwards. Again, we die once, but get lucky on the second attempt. Time for the optional will seed boss. We couldn't actually beat this one back in the Bicorn run, so let's maybe try a different strategy. We go for an Aguilao and then use our extra turn to guard. This prevents the thing from freezing us with its Bufu dying skill. We just repeat the cycle until it dies. Wow, that was actually much easier than I thought. Kormakutan becomes Regenerate 3 during a Fusion Alarm, followed by a Thoth becoming Freydine, a Mithras Nuke Amp, and we're ready for the Wakaba boss fight. Here's our setup going in. Not much to see on the equipment front, but in terms of skills, we've switched everything up. We're going all in on a boosted, amped Freydine here, and we'll be passively regenerating a lot of HP each turn, while also still having our 20% counter chance. Resist fire will be useless for this fight since Wakaba has no fire skills, but there's nothing else we really need. It would be nice to have some wind resistance in that slot for her wing blast ability, but that's not really an option yet. As always, nothing happens at first until the cutscene with Futaba plays out and she starts protecting us, so long as we give the correct responses to the dialogue options. We can't use the ballista since we have no teammates, so we just push the attack. Sadly, we're soon made dizzy at low health. This is a catch-22 because if we heal, we'll get one-shot technical because of the dizzy status ailment. But if we cure the dizziness, then our HP will be so low that we'll die anyway. We go for the heal option to see what happens, and yeah, called it. Attempt 2, and ouch. Attempt 3, oh, okay, this is looking good. Oh, a critical. Lovely. Attempt 4, and it's worth remembering that if this fight drags on long enough, Wakaba has the ability to start spamming Mega Delaon. A game ending almighty attack that kinda acts as a DPS check. We go all in on quick sprays because lowering her accuracy makes a massive difference to this fight. 
Honestly, my advice to anyone struggling with this boss, grab a boatload of free quick sprays from the second-hand clothes shop in Kijijoji before the fight begins. It makes things so much easier. Phase 2 comes around and we keep pushing the attack. Surely we only have a few turns left before the Mega Delaons begin. It's super tense and luck plays a huge factor, but eventually we deal enough damage to make her fall down and shoot her right in the face. Job done. After escaping the collapsing pyramid, we make more gains at the gym, get to rank 5 with <coughs> Kasumi, eat all of this food for only 500 yen, wow that's, that's crazy good value. Max out Ryuji to gain the ability to fuse Chi Yo later in the game which will be vital for certain skill cards and wait patiently for this queue to go down. Um, I, I don't think this queue is moving. Wait, is that lady even serving anyone? What is she doing back there? We visit Hawaii, meet your mama, take down more request mini bosses and now it's time. Yep, it's time ladies and gents, oh yes. Use any two personas during an alarm to create a persona with a yellow name, then use the gallows on Mandrake and the yellow named persona to grant 10 randomly allocated stat points to Mandrake. We then get booted out of the velvet room to go and trigger another alarm, but this can be repeated infinitely. Nope, this is not an exploit because the game has been patched many times and even re-released on other platforms, yet this feature has not been removed. I think it's fair to say if you're willing to do the grind, endlessly powering up your persona like this is fair game. We max out the twin strength confidant and the grind continues. While farming, we get a visit from an unexpected guest. No, leave us alone. We haven't saved the game in a while. Please just go away. Ah, okay, we need to run. Get away, get away. Ah! Yatagarasu becomes Black Wing Robe R, which has better evasion and 50% better defense than our current armor, and we listen to Futaba being Futaba. Is that, uh, your impression of the wind? Soon enough, Mandrake has hit max stats, and we can finally get out of Mementos and onto the fifth palace. We're dash insta killing all enemies here because we're, <laughs> kind of over leveled. During the first mini boss, we're forced to have teammates, so we just stick them on guard duty while we very quickly finish them off. This blue guy was kind of annoying since he can spawn additional enemies seemingly endlessly. There must be a cap in place though, because after a few minutes he stopped doing that and just started trying to inflict hunger on us. Ha! <laughs> Down to a critical. Ah, this mini boss mob. Gotta love him. We literally put it on auto attack and went to the kitchen to make some food. Yeah, like IRL. Ten minutes later, they're down. <laughs> like, what, what even is that fight? We shock the optional will see boss with our electrified gun, then finish it off with a nuke technical combo for massive damage. Wow, that really was a lot of damage. Anywho, it's time for the Okumura boss fight. Here's our setup going in. We're at 777 health. Nice thanks to the Warden's Baton accessory granting us plus 40%. After a quick sprint and grabbing a couple of items, the fight begins. Phase 1, they're all weak to wind, so it's over in seconds. Phase 2, same thing, but with Psy. Yeah, you can see why we picked these specific skills now. Phase 3, nuclear, nice and easy. Phase 4, wind again, but it takes a couple of rounds this time because the guys have a lot of health. Phase 5, sigh again, but our hunger status ailment is reducing our damage output. It takes a couple of rounds, but we do finally get there. Phase 6, the big boy. He's not weak to anything, so it's just a case of dealing chip damage while we keep healing up. We guard for the Bing Bang challenges, but other than that, it's a pretty easy fight. Phase 7, after we inflict a single point of damage on Haru, she self-destructs two turns later. Nice and easy. Phase 8, one-shotting a defenceless guy in a chair. <laughs> Hardly a Soulsborn boss. Job done. We take Futaba to the Jazz Club on a Sunday so she learns a new skill. We'll need to repeat this for another three Sundays for her to gain access to her full support kit. There's a brief visit to the bonus palace with mandatory party members, but we keep both allies guarding while we finish the enemies off with nuke technicals. 
after a trip to Destinyland, which is totally, definitely, positively not Disneyland, there's more jazz clubbing, more gymming, more Yusuke having a counselling session with Maruki, which will definitely never become a problem, even more jazz clubbing, more request mini bosses, and more time exploring Mementos. Poor oh, Jesus, where did you come from? Fisher Mountain becomes Atomic Flare, a strictly better version of Freydine, and we're into the Sixth Palace, Sinejima's Casino. Here's a quick confidant rank update for anyone who's curious. We're so close to getting everything to max and it's only early November. Not much to report here because the mini bosses are complete jokes. But the royal dagger inside this chest is serious business. It's really strong and much better than anything we can itemise from the Velvet Room right now. We grab our technical options, max out our relationship with Dr. Maruki. Oh gee, what a nice guy. And it's time for boss 6. Here's our setup going in. First attempt and we get greedy by going for a hit when we're not supposed to. Get penalised for it and then lose to the roulette table. <laughs> Alright, second attempt. For anyone who doesn't know how this goes, you always lose every spin until you send a teammate off to shoot the glass panels on the roulette wheel, but since we're playing solo, we are forced to lose every bet until Futaba's failsafe dialogue kicks in and we're automatically pushed onto phase 2. Nijima's element is now semi-randomised and she spins ice first. This could be dangerous if we get frozen solid because technicals would then one-shot us, but we get lucky with several dodges. Electricity is next and again shock could be a problem, but our high luck stat saves us from it. Divine is next, which doesn't have any negative status ailments, so we're pretty safe. Fire next, which we're resistant to, so again, not a problem. Finally, she spins almighty, but she's dead a few turns later. A pretty easy fight, which is to be expected since we're at max stats, but the difficulty will ramp up very, very soon. After learning how to fuse literally Satan, we go through the spoilery spoileries, get Futaba's second awakening, spend a day at the temple and the gym, even though the gym is exclusively better, almost one-shot the first mini-boss on Shido's cruise ship, almost one-shot the second mini-boss on Shido's cruise ship, and it's rat time! God, every time I play through this section, I'm so glad they made these puzzles easier than in the original version of Persona 5. They were just horrible before. <laughs> Next mini bosses, sleep technicals take them down and the cleaner puts up a bit more of a fight but it's just a battle of attrition. Alright, time for a catchy. We get some insane counter look against his two shadow pets. I mean, three counters in a row, wow. Akechi himself isn't too tough in his first form, it's just a combination of average physical and curse skills with the occasional Mega Delaon thrown in for good measure. Within a couple of minutes, we're on to the Loki phase. Now this is where things get interesting. Our high agility is paying dividends here as we're regularly evading his powerful attacks. We keep using ointments to reflect attacks back at him while our passive HP regeneration does its thing. By the end we're burning but it dissipates just soon enough for us to guard his levitate. Levitate? Is that how you say that? Levitate? I don't know. Then finish him off with one final atomic flare. Job done. Always a fun fight, that one. Okuninushi becomes official's robe R for crazy high defences, and it's time for the Shido boss fight. Here's our setup going in. The gauntlet accessory increases our evasion against criticals and magic attacks. Honestly, I have no idea if this still works if you have maxed out agility, but anecdotally, it does seem to work. Accessory choice really doesn't matter this late into the game anyway. With any luck, having null physical from the winners don't use cheats request reward is going to absolutely carry this fight. The fight begins and as always the game automatically forces three teammates into your party so we just guard with everyone until Joker is the only one left standing. This uses up Futaba's final guard but what can you do? Alright with those three dead the fight now officially begins. Phase 1, and Shido is getting twice as many turns as we do. He sometimes puts up various reflective barriers which we're forced to hit because we have no way of nullifying them. Thankfully, he's mostly just spamming physical attacks which obviously don't affect us thanks to null physical, so it's just an atomic flare spam until he changes form. He's now flying around and spamming a cycle of elemental magics, none of which we are weak to. 
things could become problematic if we get hit by an ailment such as freeze or shock though so we try to push the offensive while also keeping magic ointment barriers up to minimize the chance of that happening. Within a couple of minutes we're on to his pyramid form. His cannon fire and pyramid blast skills here are strong but have low accuracy and are very predictable so this is definitely the easiest phase so far. He charges up a final pyramid blast but instead of guarding we go for a risky attack which thankfully pays off. After a quick cutscene we're on to the second half of the fight. All teammates are resurrected here so again we get everyone including Joker to just guard until they're all dead. No Futaba, we don't want an emergency shift, go away. Shido's much stronger in this phase in case the glowing red aura didn't already give that away but again we're nullifying his physical attacks which does give us a fair few openings. Homunculi items nullify his tyrant's purge one shot ability but we don't have many of those left in our inventory so we just need to pick up the pace here. More atomic flare spamming then Shido goes all super buff and busts those spring things off him. What were those springs even for anyway? <laughs> his moves are now more flashy and become AoE but that doesn't matter to us because it's a solo run. His toughest combo is probably this madness. He charges up and then launches a barrage of various elemental tyrant skills on us. Thankfully most of it gets blocked. <laughs> we begin the forced 1v1 phase and... Wait, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> Some sort of puppeteer impression? <laughs> well, it's just a magic ointment spam until he defeats himself job done. That was a 21 minute fight, one of the longest so far. As a reward for our hard work we treat ourselves to a much better gun, gain repel fire through lockdown, get rewarded by Sojiro by him giving us his um, um, I really don't want to be carrying these around, complete the mandatory auto loss against the shiny boy and dash out of the velvet room ready to fight some angels. As always I'm trying to keep things very light on spoilers in case anyone watching hasn't actually beaten the game before but yeah we're in the very late game now so spoiler territory and all that. We farm this spiny area for fusion alarms and use the first one to convert Chi Yo into drain physical. This is an absolutely huge upgrade over null physical. Essentially we're now gaining health whenever we're hit by a physical attack which is very common. We also grab a load of electrical skill cards because we'll soon be switching from nuke to electric. You'll find out why in a minute. This glowing red duo are super quick and easy to defeat and respawn and offer great XP rewards. Nice! Here's our setup going into the Holy Grail boss fight. Equipment first for those who are interested. We're level 97 and Mandrake at 85. Our main source of damage will be an amped Maziodyne but we don't have enough room for an Lelec boost because we also have Heat Riser which increases our stats for 3 turns. No healing skill this time around since we have all 3 passive regenerations and we've stocked up on quite a lot of HP restoring items in advance. Let's go! The Holy Grail is quite a simple boss when you break it down. It just uses medium accuracy almighty skills and has the ability to fully heal itself twice so long as you don't send a teammate to cut the pipelines on top of it which obviously we can't. With our heat riser constantly up we're evading quite a lot of the attacks so it's just a 9 minute waiting game before it finally falls. But the Holy Grail is not the main event here, oh no. He was just the movie trailers that you watch at the cinema before the main film starts. Yaldabaoth is waiting for us. If you remember the Bicorn only run we did a few months back, we gave Yaldabaoth the gold award for the hardest boss in the entire run. So honestly I was super nervous going into this fight. We're trying a different strategy this time around though so let's see how it goes. Attempt 1 seems to be going quite well until the bell makes us vulnerable to all elements and we get double tapped. <laughs> On the second attempt we make it a bit further. The sword has now also been introduced which actually heals us thanks to the drain physical passive skill. Basically we need to keep the sword alive. 
We get bad luck though as it repels an electric attack back at us and the shock ailment causes us to get technicaled. Then we have this third attempt. The reason we've gone with electricity by the way is because it's the only element besides physical that will damage all of the other limbs except the sword, which we're trying to keep alive. The downside is that having the sword reflect electricity back at us is a constant shock risk, so we just have to be clever in how we use it. Star Onion items are great for this as they multiply your next magical attack by 2.5, meaning a Star Onion plus skill is much stronger and less risky than just using the skill twice. But more on those items a bit later. Yaldabaoth soon starts converging for his big skill. Even with Heat Riser up, it deals massive damage, almost one-shotting us from full health. Yikes! The second time he uses it, we stupidly go for a Maziodyne, which reflects back and shocks us again, meaning we miss our next turn. Oh, thankfully he's one limb down, or else we might have been brown bread. Just a couple of minutes later, he goes down to a regular basic attack. Nice! Satanael puts a bullet through the thing's head, and we spend Christmas with Futaba to gain a pair of headphones. Everything from this point onwards is new to the royal version of the game and PlayStation prevents recording, so we have to get the HDMI splitter capture card set up going again and we follow the butterfly around the school. New Year, New Palace. Again, we're forced to have teammates, so we keep them on guard duty until they die. Basic enemies pose zero threat, as does the Warped Abyss mini boss, which is just an auto attack spam until the cutscene triggers. Wait, there's an HMV billboard here? I thought this game didn't include real life brands. Hope you got paid for this advertising, Atlas. We go chat to our friends about the dream world we're all living in. Hey, uh, Haru, uh, did you know your dad's actually dead? Yeah, he had this full on eye bleed thing going on. Yeah, yeah sorry and all that. After rejecting Dr. Maruki's fake reality, it's time to face off against Summeri who is an auto-attack joke, followed by Sondrion. I forgot to switch back to nuke skills before this fight, meaning we can't exploit weaknesses. The problem is that Sondrion can absorb her yellow buddies here for massive HP restoration, so we're struggling to make a dent. The battle drags on for quite a long time. Thankfully, after about 8 minutes, she stops absorbing them, so the fight is actually winnable. You know what, the devs of this game actually thought of everything. There are so many clever ways of stopping you from getting soft locked in P5. Well done Atlas. Well done. Anyway, she falls to a critical and we can push on through the palace. Here's a little extra thing that I didn't know about until now. If you later backtrack to where you first met Maraki and fought the Warped Abyss mini boss, you can explore this huge open room and there's a locked chest here as well as a couple of wandering enemies. Sadly, the chest just has a cleaning spray in it, which decreases the defense of all enemies for three turns. I think it would have been really cool if they put a valuable item in here, or scattered some easter eggs around this big open hall area. I think I've played through this game like a dozen times now, and I've literally never been back here. But that's one of the best parts of Persona 5 Royal. In every playthrough, you'll always find something new to do, or a new place to explore. We interact with the creepy tentacle and then face off against this duo. The shadow on the right is weak to electricity so it doesn't take very long to kill, but the shadow on the left is super tanky and doesn't have any weaknesses, so we have to rely on technical knockdowns and lucky criticals to take it out. Back in the real world, Trader Sakai is feeling super lazy and can't be bothered to get an item from a shop that's barely 10 meters away from him. Then it's even more big gains, Futaba's Third Awakening, more shady trades, watch Summeray have some form of seizure, read the last of the books, and get accused of having COVID. You better not give that shit to my customers. Mementos expands, but the request mini bosses are as easy as ever. After hitting max level, Satan becomes Tantric Oath R, which is the best non DLC armor in the game. And now, oh yes, it's time to fight the Reaper when he decides to turn up. Come on man, do you need a Zimmer frame or something? 
We use Heat Riser, he misses his Mabafudine, and then we put up a Magic Reflection Barrier. This is actually a really good strategy for anyone struggling with the Reaper. It causes him to exclusively spam concentrated Mega Delowns, meaning the incoming damage is predictable and we can't get insta-killed or hit with any status ailments. We mostly just leave it on auto attack. Ha <laughs> ha! After 8 minutes, he falls. Nice! After another easy request mini boss, we treat ourselves to the best non DLC gun in the entire game Tyrant Pistol EX, by itemizing a Lucifer during a fusion alarm. No more messing about now, it's back into Maraki's Palace for the final stretch of the game. We can dash kill the enemies and speed through the area. This is Sparta! The optional will seed boss here is really tanky and has various elemental resistances but a good strategy is to repeatedly go for freeze technicals. It's down in under 90 seconds. We grab Repel Bless and Repel Nuke skill cards, you'll see why in a minute, and face off against the optional Jose boss. Alright, things are going well so we'll just heal up to max HP and then- wait, wait what? He one shot us? We weren't even debuffed! Oh damn, those were some really special fireworks! Second attempt and we just spam magic ointments that we bought in bulk from the clinic until he starts letting off the special fireworks again. It's a bit of a slow grind from there and it takes a lot of attention and concentration because, as we just saw, one wrong move can mean instant death. He goes down after 14 minutes. Alright, this is it people, the final boss of Persona 5 Royal. We give Maruki his calling card and get Mandrake all set up for the fight. Maruki is going to be hitting us with physical, nuke, bless and almighty damage and we're going to need to repel as much of that crap back at him if we want to have any chance of defeating him before the turn timer expires and he starts using game ending mega delowns. We also need Psycho Force and Inferno to reliably deal with the tentacles in the first half of the fight and Heat Riser will help us survive the second half of the fight with Adam Cadmon. As always we delete all of the personas so you know there's no cheating going on here though I do always upload the full length regular speed videos on Patreon for anyone who's interested. The Punish Dagger was just the best equipment from the Airsoft shop and we go with the Gauntlet accessory again but accessory choice really doesn't matter too much. Come on, let's finish this. Phase 1 and I would love to see a cosplay of this. <laughs> the tentacle on the left is weak to fire, the right one is weak to psi and the middle one is weak to physical. We need to take them out pretty much every turn if we want to reliably damage Azathoth. Failure to eliminate the tentacles means Maruki and Azathoth receive various buffs and don't take as much damage. After 5 minutes we've dealt enough damage for Azathoth to transform into its second form. Maraki now applies various rules to the fight and the tentacles weaknesses begin to change periodically. The strategy is less set in stone now as we have to constantly respond to what he's doing and the new randomised elemental weaknesses of the tentacles. Thankfully our Repel Bless and Repel Nuke skills are hard carrying the damage output and he's barely managing to scrape us. It's still a race though because if the fight drags on long enough, Maruki will start one-shotting us with Mega Delowns. Luckily we managed to hit the threshold and after 28 and a half minutes, Azathoth is out of there and we're on to the second half of the fight. We're now up against Small Golden Boy and Big Golden Boy. The game automatically adds teammates in so we keep everyone guarding including Joker until they die. This is a solo run after all. Just like in the Shido fight, this uses up Futaba's final guard meaning we have no failsafe. It's either he dies or we die. He soon starts spamming Grand Palm for massive damage. It's all mighty damage so we have no way of mitigating it. To make matters worse, we're barely scratching Maruki. Before long, we fall in defeat. Second attempt, uh, dead again. Damn, I'm, I'm playing this really badly. The timing is all over the place. Come on. Finally, we have this run. Same guarding thing until all allies are dead. This time around we take advantage of the star onions that we grew with Haru on the rooftop to more than double the power of our magical attacks. 
Meanwhile, the best time to use Heat Riser is when Maruki wastes his turn by looking this way, which coincidentally is every third turn. When Maruki's attacks hit us, we're forced to heal up, meaning our only openings for attacks are when we evade something, which happens about 20 to 30% of the time. This means that sometimes we're going four or five turns without inflicting any damage on the guy. After 16 minutes, we think sod it and go for a final psycho force, finishing him off. Maruki enjoys some time alone. I'm all yours. Use me however you want. And after guarding through the fiery punchy stage that is impossible to fail, we say that all important word. Checkmate. Can you beat Persona 5 Royal with only a single Mandrake playing solo on the hardest difficulty setting? Oh yes! This was a tough but extremely fun challenge. I hope you guys enjoy coming along for the ride. Next week we have an extra bonus video for you. Oh, I think you're gonna love it. Don't worry though, you're still getting your monthly challenge run on the first Saturday of each month. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've just squashed a 65 hour playthrough into two weeks and I am knackered. That's it. No more Persona. Ever. Oh, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love these games so much. Alright, see you later guys. Cheers. We get bad luck though as it repels an electric attack. We get bad luck though as it repels an electric attack. We get bad luck though as it repels an elect. Why can't I say this sentence? <laughs> oh my god. After rejecting Dr. Maraki's fake reality, it's time to face off against Summere. Summere, 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 Summere. Hey senpai, why don't you like and subscribe so you can see more Persona Challenge runs? We'd love to see you again!